Okay, so uh, this is the first recording of NST and Things. Uh, I will be your host, if you want to call me that. Uh, my name is Casey Smith. I am a neurosomatic therapist. Uh, I have a clinic based out of Sarasota, Florida. And uh, I want to say I've been doing this for about seven years now. And as I come into 2020, I've realized that I've uh, kind of gained a lot of experience and a certain amount of insight. And I know I've had my own struggles uh, trying to learn this type of therapy. Uh, and basically just wanted to kind of put this, uh, this podcast out there to not only inform people of the, uh, the potential of neurosomatic therapy and how it may help them, uh, but also just maybe use this as an olive branch so that others can understand it better. Uh, maybe other practitioners may hear some of what we speak about and uh, may be able to help somebody in their own practice. Um, it, sometimes it's uh, the right word, the right sentence, uh, things like that can just kind of lead us down a certain path. So uh, I just wanted to start doing some uh, some semi-short clips. I have a feeling when I start getting into certain patient cases, uh, and we won't disclose names and things like that. Um, but as we get into certain cases, uh, I'll try my best to break them down as they evolve in my own head, uh, or if it's maybe a previous patient testimonial, things like that. Uh, basically, I want to help uh, those that are hearing not only better understand their, their situation and their pain patterns, um, but also help the practitioners that may be in their lives, working with them directly currently. Um, better understand the issue and, and like I said maybe get some of those little nuggets those little tidbits of information that can really uh, be beneficial um, today is November 5th 2019 uh, and uh, it's Tuesday I have a, a short patient week this week but uh, with it already being Tuesday uh, it's already been an interesting week so I wanted to at least go over a couple uh, patient cases that I had, uh, today specifically, it was a bit of a heavy day as far as, uh, my patient load, uh, what patients required, um, you know, what I kind of bring to the table. So, uh, to start, uh, I kind of want to go over a little bit about how do you help kind of create, um, or maybe assist in, in aiding in somebody's healing potential. Uh, I had a young lady this morning who uh, had a bit of a, a setback from previous treatment, uh, and this can happen sometimes, uh, and, and it can make the therapist kind of deviate from what they want to truly do uh, or, or what their original plan was. But this young lady came in, and, and we had worked on uh, a certain variety of muscle groups that cause uh, the shoulders to depress themselves. And as that happens, it causes strain on the elevators, you know, trapezius, elevator scapula, things like that. And uh, basically after our treatment, uh, we had focused too much on one group and, uh, and not enough on another. And you can anticipate this will happen with any patient. Uh, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And in this predicament, uh, this young lady had a bit of a reaction. And it was one of those days where... You know, I spent an hour with her and she came in a really good mood and uh, she was doing better. Her migraines had subsided. All these symptoms she was dealing with were getting less and less and fewer and infre infrequent. And uh, she, I felt like she just kind of raved about, you know, the work that we did and being grateful that she met me. And then two days later after she leaves, uh, she comes back or she called or uh, sends an email, excuse me. And, uh, says, Hey, you know, I'm dealing with this issue and these are my symptoms. And it kind of came out of left field. And for me, I mean, I'm I, like, I said, I've been doing this seven years. Uh, it still kind of hits my ego. I, I expect to, you know, help a patient every time I see them, put them in the least amount of, uh, uh post-treatment pain as possible. So that recovery, that, uh, that healing crisis, everybody has the potential of going through, uh, that's usually, you know, pretty short, maybe a day or two total. And, um, she was having these reactions and I, you know, like I said, I kind of, uh, took it hard a bit and I was like, ah, you know, dang, I wish I could have done a better job or, you know, what could it have been? And I already had my suspicions and, um, 
it was interesting. She came in today. I had a uh, an opening, fortunately, and was able to get her in. And she, it was early in the morning. Both of us were fairly quiet. But I feel as though she never truly, and I, I guess this was part of, part of my thought process, was she never really uh, uh, mentioned any of the, the comments or the praise that she had given me in the previous session. And as a practitioner, I feel like we naturally want to go to a point where, you know, we react to uh, a situation as like, oh man, like I just saw them and now they're doing worse than they were when I saw them before. And I, I kind of felt like she was, uh, or she would have held it against me. And I feel like that was just my own mind just kind of taking over saying like, oh, you know, this may be, uh, this may be messing with you a little bit or, or whatever, whatever. And what I came to find out is by the end of the treatment, you know, I explained what, what I thought was happening. Um, what I thought was happening was happening. And some of the tissues that we had worked on previously hadn't released to their fullest extent, um, which was part of it. And I gave her some stretching and things like that to assist after the fact. But, um, when she left, you know, I went through this whole crazy scheme in my mind. And when she left, she was so beyond grateful just again that she, you know, we were able to get her in. I was able to break down her situation, explain to her why I thought certain things happened. And, you know, just further kind of drove home uh, a thought that I had that was just, you know, when you decide to step up in someone's life and you decide to help them uh, as a health re- healthcare practitioner, as a friend, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, they, and I guess maybe not all people see it this way, but a lot of people will see it as like, you know, they, they truly do appreciate you. Um, especially nowadays, there's less and less of that um, genuine consideration and input. And although there is a, a service and exchange taking place, there's still just, you know, you can have a, you can have a, an office that cares that, that, that ultimately loves and looks over their patients and, and truly cares about their well being. And what you'll find is those people will further kind of help, you know, put their, uh, uh their health and their well being and, and things that are going on as far as their physical health and what you're helping them with, um, in your hands and they'll be more capable of it. And it was just a, a humbling moment as a therapist, you know, I kind of realized, you know, Hey, you know, we get so caught up and this treatment didn't go a certain way. And, and maybe I would have done things differently. And, and, you know, maybe they didn't, I didn't get the reaction. You know, I was, I was expecting them to feel a certain way and they didn't feel what I was anticipating them to feel after the fact. And, uh, to not take it to heart and, and to appreciate the fact that, you know, uh, stick to your course, you know, just because somebody has an adverse reaction to something that you do or something doesn't release fully and they end up a little agitated, uh, or their body ends up a little agitated, um, don't completely change what you're doing. You know, believe in yourself, believe in your original thought process. If things need reassess, then reassess them. Um, but if you feel like you did your diligence and like you're confident in your decisions and you need to own your decisions, you need to at least follow them through. And sometimes when you think you did something the best, it could have been done better. And you have to understand that that just happens. Um, and I think that happens at many different levels. Um, many different, uh, years of experience and, and, and things like that as well. Um, but that was just a little thing that I kind of went through today. And, and this was, a uh, something that was kind of on my mind a couple of weeks back, uh, before I, I had kind of fully put the things together and wanted to, to officially start, uh, the podcast. But, um, yeah, it was just a, 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 a moment as a therapist that, you know, I think kind of further, like I said, drives home. Just that I think the more that we interact with people and the more that we um, have these closer connections and, and we're helping them um, in a significant way and we're owning what we do and we're offering the time to explain why we did them, uh, if something went wrong, how we can do them better, you know, providing a solution. Um, patients don't mind um, because they, end, they begin to understand that health is ultimately a journey. And the people that you surround your wealth, you yourself with, ultimately support your health. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of that. Um, other things uh, I had kind of happen here recently um, that I just found to be interesting. 
um, a woman who was suffering from some hot flashes. Um, we've done some work over the months and, you know, here and there, uh, odds and ends things, you know, from hips to feet to shoulders to neck problems, um, to, she worked with another practitioner here in town, uh, that was helping her and assisting her through a variety of, uh, cleanses and detoxes and, and really just cleaning up her body. She was really trying to, trying to do her diligence and she'd been struggling with hot flashes. And as far as being a neurosomatic therapist, I've never really talked to another practitioner that have talked about, um, being able to help hot flashes or that some of the specific organ work or, or neck and cranial work that we do can really help with this sort of thing. Um, but it was one of those things that was just always kind of like, you know, on the chart, something to take note of. Um, they were better, they were less infrequent, and, and they did have some changes. We uh, we did have some, uh, uh, some organ work, uh, some liver work that I believe potentially helped maybe move some, uh, uh, some toxins or some metal toxicity, um, whatever was in her body. Um, she noticed the, uh, the hot flashes start to change. Uh, or to regress a bit and then they came back again, which isn't uncommon. And, um, I had a, 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 I guess a revelation, you could call it with a, uh, a patient that then that revelation cascaded into about two dozen other patients, um, that I was treating. And there were basically certain facial cranial muscle muscles that I was, um, I guess undervaluing is really the best way to describe it. Uh, you know, we look at neurosomatic therapy and we see, uh, we have a variety of measurements that we take off different bony landmarks, specific landmarks. And through those, uh, those bony landmarks, we can, uh, kind of determine certain distortions, maybe where pressure is, uh, maybe where, uh, the body isn't communicating with the rest of the body the way that it should. And by doing what seemed to be very minute influencers, I guess is the best way I can describe it. Um, and like I said, I kind of undervalued these, these tissues. I was finding that patients and even this patient specifically would chew the inside of their cheek. They'd chew excessively on one side. Um, they would have a grinding problem. They would have a, glen- a crunching, clenching problem. They would have a mouth garden of sorts. Uh, at night, uh, to kind of deter the, the negative effects of that. And what I was finding is by, instead of going after, you know, the pterygoid muscles and the, 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 the deep belly and the masseter and these big movers and things like that, I started treating their facial muscles. And I don't know how this came to me. It just kind of popped in one day and I used it on a patient per their sit predicament. Um, it just kind of came to me and it worked in a way that I wasn't expecting. Now, many of these patients I've done other treatments to try to correct their C1, C2. And I guess as a practitioner, looking back, I made those corrections to the best of my abilities. And to my knowledge at that point, they were in the best place they could possibly get. Um, after discovering this, I was finding that I was getting those uh, those patients, uh, C1 and C2 alignment, specifically C1, in a much better position than I had ever imagined before. And what I've come to realize, and this comes into another discussion that I'll probably end up having, is that we've entered into a, uh, or we've created a society, I should say, that is so technological and so go, 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 we gotta do the next greatest thing driven, that not only does our, our, our heart, our pericardium, kind of respond to this, but we end up holding the tension, uh, neurologically. And as you overstimulate the system, as the system feels more tension, uh, a lot of people think will things start to do things unconsciously. Uh, unfortunately clenching, grinding, things like that, like that are one of them, uh, even nervous habits of chewing the inside of your lip or your jaw or, you know, your cheek. Um, this has an influence. And basically what I was finding with this patient was that, uh, she was a bit, uh, you know, had a bit of a, she was on the higher stress, higher anxiety side. 
and at night she was having a clenching problem. The minute we went through and worked some of these facial muscles, I did my diligence, worked around her tongue, the base of her mandible, and she described shortly after our treatment as as we were wrapping up that she noticed a metallic taste. She was tasting metal. And uh, this kind of falls into the category of, you know, you kind of need to educate yourself a little bit as a practitioner. Um, Understand that there's metals in the bodies. People can have methylation problems. They may have metal in their bodies that they can't excrete well because they're low methylators or whatever the case may be. And this patient was one of those patients who was a low methylator. She was tested. Um, that was confirmed to another practitioner and they had done a variety of detoxes to help with the met with the metal issue. And to that point it had gotten better. Uh, but she was still having hot flashes and some other issues as well. And, uh, mostly digestive. And, uh, after she, we had done this treatment, she had noticed a metal taste after about two days, that metal taste started to go away. And, um, she had noted on another treatment, uh, which this is another common uh, symptom after receiving a liver treatment is, uh, we did a liver flush and, and worked through some of her viscera that day. And she had noted, uh, that she had some burning in her stools, which isn't uncommon when you have maybe some metals or toxicity coming out of your body. Um, your body excretes things. It's one of the ways to get rid of it. And, uh, on these two occasions, she noticed, you know, having these kind of, uh, these extreme symptoms, uh, or w- w- that were a bit unusual. And, uh, roughly about three weeks later, um, she was still noticing that, uh, well, the, the metal taste in her mouth and, and stuff had gone away. But what she was noticing was that she, um, was no longer having hot flashes and the frequency had gone down substantially. So this woman, like I said, you know, I treated her for, I want to say it's been at least two years and it's, you know, maybe I see her once a month and maybe a little bit more frequently in the beginning, but then it kind of got to a point of maintenance. Um, and she comes in for her health and well-being, basically. And we try to make some, some strides when we can. And this was one of those situations where um, I just happened to be working with this type of information uh, on another patient and found that, hey, I think this is going to apply to a lot of other cases. And the more I dug and the more I explored, I was finding out that that exactly was the case. Um, this kind of segues into my last patient of the day, which, uh, wanted me to kind of take some time tonight to make this podcast was, uh, a similar situation where, uh, well, I shouldn't say similar. Uh, this woman does not have hot flashes. Um, she is a bit younger in age, roughly five, 10 years. And she was in a, a terrible, terrible car accident. Um, she was very fortunate um, and the fact that she's alive and they were able to reconstruct a certain portion of her, uh, her face. Um, she surprisingly looks well with minimal scarring, things like that. Um, it did a tremendous amount of damage to the, uh, her viscera and her abdomen, um, her intestines, her, her uterus, her bladder, everything was basically torn away from her pelvic floor. Uh, she had to have a hysterectomy, things put back in place and kind of rebuilt and since she's come into my care, uh, our primary focus has been, um, back pain, trying to get her well again, trying to get her up again, trying to get her, uh, on her feet so that she can, you know, go to the gym, do all these sorts of things, hopefully lose a little bit of weight, uh, get her diet and things like that in check, um, and further help her, her body, her structure kind of get back in better alignment and better physical health. And in the recent months, uh, we've, she's had some headache, migraine issues. And again, this was one of those patients where, uh, that was kind of better. And we were basically focusing a bit more on her lower body and her, her low back specifically, um, trying to, to provide a little help there. And as I was coming up kind of across this revelation of, you know, these, these subtle changes in the facial muscles and these subtle things that people are doing in their day to day, um, I was finding that, just looking at her case, looking at her measurements, she had similar distortions, similar problems as other patients had. And, um, the first time I had kind of mentioned this to her, I said, Hey, you know, some of the areas we're going to work through may have potential scar tissue. 
Um, it could bring up maybe some memories, you know, of the incident itself. It's not uncommon for patients to have somatic emotional releases um, during treatment, and uh, this could easily be one of those those situations because it was such a traumatic experience in in itself. And um, I feel like the first time we did it, I I put it in with everything else I planned that day, or maybe some things I didn't get done the treatment before, and. Today, I just, when I saw that she was on my schedule, I made a commitment to myself and I I did this with another patient as well. And I was just like, you know, this is what I'm thinking and I'm going to follow through with it. And this kind of comes back to, you know, the young lady who, who ended up with a harsh reaction and, and I had to just kind of follow through with my plan and, and kind of trust myself that I, I understood what was happening. Um, and by doing so, I, I felt like I did such a better, more thorough job going through, checking these areas, rechecking these areas, finding tissue that was ischemic, type, finding tissue that was locked up, the little areas where scar tissue had built up. A lot of those areas where scar tissue were uh, had been built up, it was interesting, we're actually having strong referral pains, um, or I should say referral symptoms into her ear. Um, what she had come in today really complaining about was her ear uh, issues. She had noticed um, some tinnitus and, uh, some vertigo, which has gotten better with the Atlas stability and things like that. Um, but like I said, you know, these patients that I thought I had where they should be as far as C1 alignment, cranial alignment, things were wanting to shift back and it was subtle at times. And it's one of those things where you're just like, Oh, that's out again. And you go to fix it because that patient came in with, you know, a wrist issue that's new and they want it resolved because they have something going on and and you just get distracted. You get, you know, it it pulls away from, Hey, maybe there's something deeper here. Maybe I should, you know, really spend an entire treatment really trying to resolve this issue. And it could really provide some long-term benefit. Um, but we can also oftentimes just kind of set that back because of the, the patient's priorities that day. And, um, I want to say I spent at least, I want to say a good 30 minutes, um, going through this with her. And, and there were some times where we stopped and just had to talk and had to explain, Hey, um, this is what's happening. Uh, I had provided some, some, uh, some examples of other patients that I'd worked with in similar issues and somatic emotional releases and, um, why, you know, these areas were so sensitive and, and why it was important that we actually address them. And in a sense, why, uh, and I mean, there's no other better way to kind of word this, but why to suffer through it? Why to endure it? And it's one of those things where you can just kind of, you know, bite the bullet. Hopefully gravely you have a, a, a you know, good practitioner. Um, and as they do their diligence, um, it's going to be a short lived problem. You're dealing with it now because you're taking on everything at once. Um, they're working the dysfunction out of the tissue. They're getting it to release properly. They're getting it to lengthen properly. So then in the future, you don't have that problem every day instead of that little bit every day creeping in on you, constantly being a nag, constantly keeping you from doing that next activity or whatever else you want to do. So, uh, as we work through getting that to open up, surprisingly, she found, or we found um, that there were a lot of uh, lesions, a lot of trigger points that were not only radiating to her ears, but were also contributing to the tinnitus, um, which isn't uncommon. Um, and for a patient that's dealing with these types of issues, this is definitely an area that I found um, not only in this woman, which is a bit of an extreme case just because of what her body's been through, uh, but with some other patients as well. This has also helped um, with some potential trigger point referrals or affecting, you know, maybe how, uh, the ear is functioning. If it's, you know, maybe not opening and closing properly, like they're, they're noticing a, a clogged type, type sensation, um, or some patients, like I said, with this individual that were uh, dealing with some kind of tinnitus. So, um, just some interesting things, uh, I've kind of been working with in the past couple of weeks, some lessons I've gone through. Um, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm entering a phase in my, uh, uh, my practice and in my uh, professional career where I'm going through a, uh, another uh, kind of phase of growth. Uh, I used to always kind of get lessons in threes. It seemed like I'd have patients come in with, uh, 
you know, three migraine patients, three uh, tennis elbow patients, uh, uh, you know, three sciatic patients, whatever the case may be. And um, I feel like I'm going through the the next level. I'm seeing things um, a bit more connected. And uh, as I see them a little more clearly, uh, I know I'm a very tactile, hands-on kind of person, visual person. Uh, and all this, is, though this is uh, audio, I hope that uh, maybe some individuals lift, listening, whether they be patients or therapists alike, um, I hope that I can at least maybe provide a little insight and maybe help connect the dots a little bit. Uh, I think we've lost a lot of that critical thinking ability and we put that responsibility in other practitioners' hands or other individuals' hands and ultimately it has to kind of, you know, begin to seed and blossom in our own um, before we can expect others to uh, to help us in that journey. So. Uh, like I said, I hope this uh, often uh, or helps offer uh, some insight to a variety of different different issues. Uh, I would like to bring different patient cases uh, as far as, you know, distortions, how neurosomatic therapists look at it specifically, as well as uh, providing some uh, a little bit of knowledge and information for uh, for patients alike so that they have a resource and, uh, you know, we can begin to reshape healthcare into what it truly should be. Uh, and not the uh, the mill that it is currently today. So I uh, hope to see you all uh, or hear you all back again. And uh, if you have any comments, please uh, like and comment below. And esteem things. Out.